We're well on our way to the Georgia coast on a flight down to the Bahamas, but it looks like we'll have a little weather to deal with. Hey everyone, Clay from Claviation.com. On our last flight, we discussed pilotage and dead reckoning, navigating only by our sectional chart and visual checkpoints. When we reached the Allendale Airport, we turned south towards Savannah. For this flight, we're still going to keep our iPad and GPS off, but we'll navigate by using VORs, which are ground stations that broadcast a signal in every direction, like spokes on a bike wheel. We can use our NAV1 or NAV2 course deviation indicators, or CDI, to receive that signal and determine which radio we're on. Check the description for a link to a video that introduces VOR navigation if you need the basics. Right now, we need to track away from the Allendale VOR. Looking at the sectional, there's a blue line that connects the Allendale VOR to the Savannah VOR. It's called a Victor Airway, Victor 37 in this case. It shows that the magnetic course is 176 degrees from the station. Let's tune in the Allendale VOR into our nav radio. So 116.7 is the frequency. We'll pop open our COM1, NAV1, this is our X-Plane 430. If we push this CV button, we can move down into our NAV1. We're in the standby. Big knob is going to move up to 116. Small knob is going to move 55 up to 7. And at that point, we just hit this B key to flip that into the active. Now, we see our, v our CDI needle come alive. To know that we are navigating uh, and talking to the right VOR, we actually need to identify the Morse code. So if we go over to our radio stack and press the nav1 key here, we're going to hear our Morse code. <laughs> Okay, so we are tuned and identified to the Allendale VOR. Now, VOR navigation is all about being able to visualize the radials and where you are. And a really helpful tip in X-Plane is use M to pull up the map at any time. And it's a great way to get a pictorial view of where you are in relation to the station. Uh, this is us. Looks like we've got our little tow plane out here flying as well. So you can see we've got the Allendale VOR to the top, Savannah VOR down to the bottom. X-Plane shows that Victor 37 connects the two, so we are heading to the south and a little bit left of course. But let's go ahead and see if we can get on course using our um, VOR. To navigate from a station, you start off by trying to plug in the radial um, that you're trying to navigate on to the top of the CDI. So if we're navigating on the 176 radial, let's go over to our CDI. We want to actually plug in 176 to the top here, this arrow at the top. 175, 176, okay. And we should see a from flag since we are navigating from the station, which is this FR and the flag back to the station that down flag is from. So we are looking good there. Now, we don't need to worry about this horizontal needle here. That's not for VOR navigation, but this vertical needle is what's telling us if we're on or off course. So, if the needle is to the right, the course is to the right. If the needle is to the left, the course is to the left. And we want to set up our VORs to where we sense correctly like that, which is why we put in 176 instead of the reciprocal, which we'll get to momentarily. So, in this case, we want to actually turn our aircraft and fly to the right to intercept that needle. <clears throat> As we fly to the right, we're going to see that needle come in a little closer. We want to turn to get back on a 176 um, course as that comes in. Pop open our map. We can see that that airplane is flying right near us somewhere. but ultimately that we are heading now towards Victor 37. Now, we can make a little bit more aggressive of an intercept angle here if we like. Really watch that come in. Every little dot out here to the right or left is two degrees um, that we are off course. 
And of course, that distance, two degrees, uh, is in a set distance. The further you are away from the station, um, the bigger distance two degrees is. But in this case, we're going to uh, intercept the course to the south. Now, we still have a 20 knot wind that's set from the west from our last flight, and we need to take our wind effects into consideration. So just simply turning to a heading of 176 is not going to get us where we want to be because the wind is going to blow us off course. So in a moment, we're going to look at wind bracketing to try to stay on our VOR radial uh, with our wind in. Now right now, we are navigating from the Allendale VOR. In X-Plane, um, the VOR radials, they have unlimited range. You could navigate um, pretty much forever. Maybe there is a limit, but it's, uh, it's pretty big if there is one. I haven't found it. In the real world, though, many VOR stations, you're going to get about a 40 nautical mile range on it. And we can see that needle coming in nicely. So let's go ahead and turn here. And let's get back to roughly 176 on the heading. Start our wind bracketing process. Now, we are going to navigate from the Allendale VOR for about half the way, and then we're going to switch over and navigate to the Savannah VOR uh, for the other bit. And I've actually selected, if you remember when we left Augusta on the last flight, we followed a river outbound for a little bit. And if you remember that one, we're about to fly over it again. And uh, I believe that is the Savannah River. And this is a great landmark um, to select here because we know that we're on a VOR radial uh, heading somewhere, but it's hard to tell how far away from the station or exactly where on that radial you are without a nice visual landmark like this. So as we cross this river is kind of where I've chosen to go ahead and switch over to the Savannah VOR and tune that one going inbound. So while we are kind of working on getting established, we're, we're kind of maneuvering around. We're close to this VOR radial. We're not right on it. And part of that is probably because of our wind drift that we need to correct for. But it's close to center, which means that we are um, we're generally where we need to be. But let's go ahead and flip over to the Savannah VOR and start tracking that inbound. Now we need to tune it on 115.95. So we can go back down here, push CV to get our cursor down to the nav one. Um, and then we can actually, let's flip it down and adjust this 116. So 115, big knob to 115, small knob to 95. Flip that back in. Now when we're navigating to a station, we don't actually have the heading that we're coming from or the radial that we're navigating on selected in the top because now we're kind of going in reverse. So we actually need to have the radial that's coming out the other side of the VOR station um, in the um, CDI. And I kind of think of it like a skewer, like the radial has a tail that comes out the back. And that's kind of when we're navigating inbound, we're kind of navigating inbound on the tail of that skewer that goes through the station. So. Um, we want to have a 181 because we're navigating on the 001 radial uh, coming out of Savannah. And so we want to have a 181 selected in our CDI, and that's because that's the reciprocal, or the one that's coming out the other side of 001. So if we go ahead and let me zoom in so you can see what we're doing, we're going to go ahead and put 181 in our CDI. And let's listen and see if we've got the right um, station. Perfect. So now, if we go ahead and we can see that we are right of course, so if we go ahead and fly, sorry, we're left of course, the needle is to our right go ahead and fly to our right, we should be able to go intercept this radial. All 
I'm going to bring this on around so we can get that to come in. So remember, the further from the station you are, the more distance you are off course for each dot that that needle is swung to the left or right. So when you're navigating right near the station, being one or two dots off, you're pretty close to that. Um, you're pretty close to that radial, so you don't want to have a too aggressive of an intercept angle, um, which is basically just the difference in your heading and the radial. But we're pretty far out. We've got a ways to go to get to Savannah. Approaching about a dot now of being off course here. And again, if we pull up in our map, we can actually see that we're heading right, we're right off that line. We're about to intercept it. So let's get back and see what we're looking like. Once that needle gets about to the outside of that hollow dot on the inside, some call it the donut, we want to go ahead and um, make our turn back onto course. Now to start our wind bracketing process, we, we know the wind's coming out of the west, right? We're heading uh, southwest right now, so the wind's coming kind of off from our right, which means we know we're going to have to turn to the right some in order to correct for this wind. If we just head 181, we're going to get blown to the left off course. Let's go ahead and turn to start off over to 181 now that that needle is coming in. So if we just hold this heading of 181, I'm expecting to see a drift of that needle to the left, I'm sorry, to the right, because the wind is now pushing us over to the left and the course is going to be over to our right, and sure enough we see a little drift. See that needle moving? So let's do this. Let's turn back to kind of re-intercept that, get it right in the middle. And as that comes in, let's reestablish ourselves, not on 181, but 161. Let's add 5 degrees to it and see if we drift with that. We're still just to the left, of course, here. The needle is almost lined up. So one, let's try 161. I'm sorry, 186. Let's see what that does to us. We'll hold this heading for just a moment. And let's watch carefully for any drift. Now it's kind of drifting, we're kind of drifting back to the left. That's, that line is swinging to the right. So let's go ahead and turn again to re-intercept that course this time we're going to try a 10 degree wind correction Let's see if that helps us out at all so we're not getting very far off course we're not letting ourselves drift very far off course there there we are we're lined back up again so let's try 191 Okay, this is holding us on pretty good. So we're going to call this our uh, heading we need to fly right now. 
to stay on course. 191 is doing the trick for us. And we might need to make some minor adjustments, but this is doing a pretty good job. Turning us 10 degrees into the wind has done the trick here. Now uh, let's look a little bit more at our wind and weather settings. So if we pop open our airplane for the flight here and go to our customize our weather, there are several different uh, weather configurations you can play with. If we go back one, you can actually change this slider here um, for general presets. Anything from clear on up to cirrus clouds, and then they add in some scattered clouds, broken clouds, overcast clouds, low visibility, foggy, and then you get stormy. So you're kind of going from the best weather to the worst weather. And if we go to uh, customize, we can actually um, change the way that we have everything set. Now, by moving those sliders, I have just deleted the wind layer that I had in, but our wind, we can set by hitting add wind layer, and a new little wind layer blue thing comes up here on the left side. So we can actually uh, change the parameters of the wind layer over here to the left, and um, we can actually set it, I think I had my wind layer set somewhere around 5,000 feet and the cool thing is it'll actually show you when you hit enter it'll show you what the AGL altitude is of that but we're flying 5,500 um, so we're going to set the wind around there and we had this a 20 knot wind uh, I'm sorry a 270 degree here so that here you can drag the arrow around or set the degrees and we had this set to 20 knots so that's what gets us our Wind speed, we could set turbulence if we want to bump around a little bit. We could set gusts and, uh, you know, a specific, we could set a five knot gust, for instance, if we want to see that, which is just basically an increase in that wind speed. And we could also set some wind shear, so we could actually set a direction for the winds to be uh, changing from uh, if we want some added challenge there. Now, in this case, um, I like the wind set as I have it, nice winds aloft 270 at 20 is what we're working with and we have that nicely set now you can set up to three wind layers um, in your properties and um, you can kind of drag those around now notice something though you cannot drag a layer underneath another layer so once you add a new layer it populates up at the top you're going to need to consider that and build from the ground up so if you want to set your weather um, at higher winds aloft then great we're on a good track with this but if you want to set your winds uh, down at the ground at a certain speed, uh, you need to kind of think ahead. And at this point, we need to turn this 270 at 20. If we wanted to set our winds uh, at, let's just say, 300 at 5, which is 300 at 5, if we're looking to do that at the surface, well, then we can now drag this down to the surface. Or we could just set our altitude with our slider here and look once we're down to about zero AGL in this range, that's generally our surface. So we're near sea level, so we've only got about a 80 foot or so elevation difference. So there we are, we can set it to zero AGL, um, the wind is set, and then now we can take this top layer, and plug back in our 270 at 20 knots there you have our two wind layers. Now we can also set our cloud layers. I've got some scattered cumulus that, that the uh, system picked up from those sliders. Again, you can click on this. The right hand bars are your clouds and the left hand bars are your wind. So if you click on one of the layers, you can now alter that layer. Now depending on which layer uh, type you're working with, you can actually change the, the thickness of that layer. So you can set the tops and the bases of the cloud if you want a nice thick layer to fly through if you're doing some instrument flying or adding some challenge. Um, or you can just set the cloud types based on um, these little preset buttons right here. So I had some nice kind of high overcast cumulus cloud set um, uh, that, was, that was kind of above us. Now, we can add some challenge here, uh, and again, you got to think about building from the ground up. So if we if we pull this slider down to the bottom, and let's just say we want to add a uh, a nice broken cumulus layer, and let, let's make our bases uh, just a few hundred feet off the ground. Let me 
drag this up 646 feet off the ground and let's make that go up you know a couple thousand feet there we go and then we can add another cloud layer another one pops up and these don't interfere with your wind layers by the way so you can kind of man maneuver those individually however you can only have up to three cloud layers up to three wind layers so let's do a nice uh, stratus layer stratified layer there and let's just set this uh, it's at 10,000 AGL yeah that's pretty good that's nice and high and let's go ahead and see what that looks like you can hit apply changes and the simulator is going to draw your clouds okay so now we've got clouds above us and clouds below us this makes for an interesting challenge um, as a visual pilot we can't fly th down through the clouds. Now, we're in the simulator, so we can effectively try what we want to, but we try to keep this as true to real life as we can. Um, so, or we can actually see the Savannah Airport, actually, through the kind of cloud up there. Um, so, we, we know we're approaching it. We're on the VOR, and we don't know exactly how far out we are from Savannah at this point. But we know that we're heading in that direction, we know that we can see it, so we can eyeball that distance. Uh, however, we got some clouds that are coming in. So we can check our ATIS, our automatic term, automated terminal information system. Um, some, some airports have an ASOS, an automated service observation, um, or an AWOS, an automated weather observation. That's just different uh, electronic systems that report the weather to you, that you can tune in and listen to. Now, I have already tried an X-Plane to listen to the Savannah weather. And for whatever reason, that is not reporting. Most of the airports that I've listened into on X Plane have worked just fine. Savannah's is not. So, for the purposes of today's illustration, we're going to assume that the weather at Savannah is as we just said it, which is too low to land. There's a couple reasons. We can't see the runway. We can kind of see it from here, but as we get lower, we're going to be going through these clouds, which we can't do. Let's add a little bit of challenge to what we're working with here. If we open back our weather settings, Let's add a little rain. If we go to the precipitation slider, um, you can do some light rain, some moderate rain. Let's go ahead and, and put some nice moderate rain in there. Moderate to heavy there. You can add storminess, which adds more bumps and lightning and things of that nature. Right now, let's just uh, keep some, some moderate rain in there. And let's pull our visibility down to around 10. And this kind of thing happens in the real world. You'll be out flying as a visual pilot weather changes very quickly and all of a sudden now you've got some clouds that are rolling in below you and you're getting above a cloud layer and you got some rain maybe that comes in or a storm that you don't see and you got to figure out what to do um, now one of the things that if I were if this were really happening is I'd be looking around and determining where where I can land I'd want to get down on the ground and I'd want to find an airport and I'd want to uh, look at my options and really get a good picture of the weather we're pressing on since we're in the simulator and we're ready to get to the, down to the Bahamas. But we're going to assume at this point that we cannot get into Savannah because the weather is too low, because we've set the weather too low. So at that point, at this point, we need to look at an alternate. And we're going to find an alternate airport to go land at tonight. And we are going to check the weather there and see what that's looking like. So Hilton Head uh, is actually right out on the coast, and it's not too terribly far away. So we can actually divert to Hilton Head. Now, if we were to turn, tune in and listen to that um, ATIS at Hilton Head, we can see that it's 121.4. So let's just plug that in. Let's see what it's reporting out there. Let's see if it's reporting what we just said. Flip over to our comm standby. Go to 121.4, little number, little knob here. That's adjusting us up got to click a lot on these little numbers to get up to where you want it because there's a lot of little increments. And I went a little too far. And now I'm just in the, the big knob. There we go. Three, six, five. Let's go down to one, two, one. One, two, one point four. Is that right? 121.4, that's correct. All right, let's flip that into the active. Hilton Head Information Echo. 1300 Zulu weather. Wind 300 at 5. Visibility 10, rain. Sky conditions 450 broken, 11,000 overcast. 
temperature 14, dew point 14, altimeter 2992, arriving runway 21, departing runway 21. Advise on initial contact, you have echo. Okay, that's pretty much what we set. So we could actually change the weather now to know exactly what it looks like out there, and we'll do that. But for simulation purposes, we're going to leave our weather set to low so we can't get into Savannah. Now we're going to divert over to Hilton Head. Now if we look at our VOR needle right here, we're actually now getting a little to the right, of course, because we are our needle is drifting to the left, so we need to fly left to get back to our needle. And we can do that. I'm going to show you a neat little thing that we can do here, though. If we go down to our autopilot, which we've been using to fly, we can actually press the nav key. And I've got a full video on the autopilot if you want to know the ins and outs of this. But once we're now nicely set up and flying using our autopilot, the nav key is actually going to use um, the autopilot to turn us back and get us onto course with that VOR needle, which is kind of neat. So it's now turned us to a correction. We're heading south. So it's given us about a, uh, oh, what, 20, maybe 10, 15 degree correction there. And now it's going to intercept that for us. So that's kind of nice uh, to use if you want to make sure you stick right on your course. Now, the question comes now, how do we get out to Hilton Head Airport? Um, we could just turn straight towards Hilton Head looking at a map. Um, we could make a general um, assessment of where we are. Part of the problem with this weather, though, is we don't have a good visual of the ground below us to tell exactly where we are. And without being able to see that, and given that we're adding the extra challenge of not using our GPS and our iPad, and we're just using our sectional and our VORs for this portion of our flight, we need to really make sure that we're using our VOR to get us there um, effectively. So, again, pulling up our map, knowing where we are, in relation to the VOR, and this is a little bit cheating because this is giving us a, you know, an airplane on a moving map, but for visualization purposes, we're now heading to, to Savannah, and we want to head right out to HXD, Hilton Head, which is right out here. So we want to make a general turn. We want to actually intercept another radial of this VOR and fly outbound from the Savannah VOR right to KHXD. Now, how do we know which one to use? Well, we've got these compass roses that go around the VOR that we can kind of eye, and we can kind of say, well, we got the kind of 060 radial coming off. There's a 067, 068, maybe somewhere 067, 068, kind of hard to tell exactly. Um, if we had a plotter, we could get out and actually measure it. But let's use our resources wisely. The chart supplement is what it's now called, formerly the Airport Facility Directory, is information on each airport. And if we look up, the um, this, this is why I really love for any sim user to have um, a real-world sectional chart, a real-world chart supplement, air, your AFD. Um, you can go out to your local airport and pick up one of those, or order it online, you can get those delivered to you. And you don't have to keep those current when you're just using it for the simulator. You can grab it once and it's going to be good because any changes aren't going to be reflected in, in x -Plane. Um But if we open up this AFD, or chart supplement, and we look at the information for Hilton Head, we can actually see a little section that says that it's on the, in the navigation section, that it's on the 085 radial off the Savannah VOR, and it's 26 nautical miles. Well, that's pretty awesome. Um, now we can just pick up the 085 radial out of Savannah. Now again, we have to kind of picture this in order. So the 085 radial is a line, obviously, between Savannah and Hilton Head. So the first thing we need to do to pick up this radial is just simply make a turn in the general direction of that radial. So we can turn maybe a, um, what are we flying now? We can turn about probably a 140, 150. I mean, the, the further we turn, the further out we're going to pick it up. So. We can go ahead and set our heading bug. We're flying using the nav mode right now, and the autopilot's holding us on our nav, but if we switch back to HDG, that's now going to pick up our heading bug and turn us in the direction we select there. I really love flying with the autopilot and the flight simulator, um, just given uh, how many things you have to kind of do, and the, and the views are challenging, and you're clicking things, and it's just a little bit different than the real world. Um, it's really nice to have that kind of hold everything for you while you get configured and so you can focus on other things that you're learning. So if we open up our map, we can kind of verify that what we're doing makes sense. And yes, indeed, we're kind of heading out towards the coast now, and we're heading towards what that line would be, uh, 
heading from Savannah to HXD. Now, we've already got Savannah tuned and identified in our nav one. So what we can go ahead and do is, since we're going to be heading outbound or from the station, we can set 08, uh, what did I say it was, 085 in our CDI. It's right here. Now it's going ahead and giving us a from, because we're kind of on that hemisphere of, the, uh, of that side of the VOR. And, uh, and our needle is fully deflected here. So what's going to happen is, as we approach this radial, again, our needle is going to start to swing in. So we need to watch for that to start swinging in for us to turn and intercept it. While we take this little trip over and we have a couple minutes, I want to review the use of our DME, which is Distance Measuring Equipment. And this is the very bottom um, little piece of equipment here in our radio stack. We're going to use our DME to get out to Hilton Head. Now, there are several ways we could figure out. We, we determine the Hilton Head is 26 nautical miles um, away from the Savannah VOR. So once we're established on that radial, there's a few ways we could determine um, how far out we are. And the easiest of that is if that VOR has DME, we're going to be able to use it. Now, every VOR has DME. There are some that don't. There's a VOR, there's a VOR DME, and then there's a VORTAC, which that's an element used by the military. Ultimately, they're all going to navigate using your needle um, the way that we're talking about today, but only the VOR DME or the VORTACs are going to have uh, DME. So our Allendale VORTAC, for instance, doesn't have that. You know that based on the symbol um, that is at the center of the VOR. So there's a few different ways uh, that we can use our um, our DME here. Um, there are three different um, switch settings that are down here. You've got a remote, a frequency, and a ground speed slash time. Now, if we use our remote, that's actually going to pull from the navigation frequency, and it's going to tell us um, our distance based on what we have plugged into our nav. Now, what I have found in this airplane is that this DME is actually hooked up to our, um, our NAV2. So if we were to plug our Savannah VOR station, 115.95 is what we're navigating on. If we were to plug 115.95 in our NAV2, which is this area here, big knob for 115, small knob up to 95, flip that into the active, we're going to see this DME come alive. Now, this is our NAV2 here. So we've got NAV1 is what we're kind of looking at, and I think we're starting to see that needle come in a little bit here. That's what we're navigating to now on the 085 radial. And now we've got our NAV2 going on. So we could navigate, you know, center it up and see where we are. We can see exactly which, um, which radial uh, that we're on if we wanted to kind of look at that. If you get a from indication... That's going to be the radial that we're coming from, the station. Um, so you can actually see right now, we're right on about the 065 radial coming out of the station. But we're not using this for the navigation so much. We're, we're looking at the top one at NAV1 to come in. What we're looking at with our DME is we're looking at a couple things. We've got, um, we've got a distance, and it's going to give us also our ground speed. Now with remote selected, that's going to pull the frequency from our NAV2. We could also go over here and click the arrow over to Frequency. Frequency is where we can actually plug in whichever we want, whichever station we want. Um, so uh, 115.95, if we wanted to just bump this up one, we could plug it in manually. And assuming that that's got a um, DME on the VOR, distance measuring equipment, we're going to actually be able to see the information we want. By flipping over to this third mode, which is the ground speed and time, that's where we really get the meat and potatoes of the information that we're looking for. So it's saying we're 4.5 nautical miles away from the station. And it's saying that our ground speed is 66 knots. And you look at that and you go, well, gosh, we're going really slow. Well, our, uh, let's go ahead and intercept this. Our needle has just come in. So let's go ahead and turn. And overshoot that just a tad, but let's go ahead and turn towards that. 
085. Get that centered up. All right, back to our DME. It's showing us our ground speed in relation to the station. So as we now are moving uh, to a more direct route away from the station, our ground speed's picking up. It's now 114. Um, so unless you're heading directly to or from the station, your ground speed is not going to be showing accurately uh, to your actual ground speed um, of the airplane. So now we're heading out and away from the station. And you can see we overshot that just a little bit, which is common. We were chatting. I think that's a theme in my videos here. I tend to overshoot that needle a little bit when I get to talking. But now we can kind of uh, learn, use what we learned before and fly the course to the left to intercept that again. So if 085 is the course we want to, uh, to get, um, of course we want to track. Let's turn to 060. It's, you've seen that's now come in nicely. Let's go ahead and turn back to 085 sure that we don't overshoot it going the other way. But that's the point, is that uh, you can go back and forth on a, on a radial and play with that all day long to get it uh, centered. And like I said, we could hit nav if we wanted to and have that radial be tracked. So what we can see with our DME down here now, now that we're following this radial nicely, is that we've got a 115 knot ground speed traveling away from that station. Um, it's telling us three minutes. Now, that's if we were pointing at the station. But again, if we pull up our map, we can see not now how this, boy, this little tow plane really likes us, doesn't he? He's really, uh, he's really hanging out, flying around us, sticking close if we need him. But we can tell that we are now heading away from the Savannah station. Um, and so uh, if we were to turn around and, and head straight back towards it, that DME would give us a, a pretty good estimation based on what our ground speed is showing. Um, of how long it's going to take to get to the station. Now, that doesn't help us now because we're heading away from it, so that's just going to keep climbing. Um, but what we know is that our Hilton Head Airport is 26 nautical miles away. So at this point, when we see 26 nautical miles uh, show up on our DME, we're going to be over the airport. We obviously want to plan, um, plan a little bit and get ahead of that so we can descend down. So we're, you can see now our, our DME distance should be climbing. And it is. We're eight miles away from the station and climbing. So we've got about, uh, what, 16 nautical miles to go until we are out to build the head. Now, general, some, some very basic descent planning for us here. We're at 5,500 feet. And Hilton Head is uh, just uh, 19 feet above the above the water, so we have generally 4,500 feet. That'll get us down to 1,000 feet, which is pattern altitude that we want to lose. We like to keep in a descent rate of about 500 feet per minute. So if we descend at 500 feet per minute, um, how long will that take us to get down 4,500 feet? Well, that's nine minutes. Is what that would take at 500 feet per minute. You can just do 500. Um, you know, nine times you get 1,500. So the question is, we need to start descending. Or how far out do we need to be uh, to allow for nine minutes worth of descent? Well, in this airplane and in most airplanes that we're going to fly um, that are single engine like this, um, we are traveling, uh, right now we're traveling about 100 knots indicated, um, is showing us 116 over the ground, but that is still generally uh, 120 knots would be two nautical miles per minute. That's kind of how that works. In your car, if you're going 60 miles an hour, you're going a mile a minute. So you double that here in the airplane, 120 is two miles a minute. So what did we say? Uh, nine minutes of travel is what we need to do. So if we're going uh, two miles in a minute, then nine miles, uh, I'm sorry, nine minutes times two is 18. So we want to allow ourselves about 18 nautical miles to descend at 500 feet per minute. Now, we need to get on descending, don't we? So we might need to make our uh, descent a little bit more aggressive. But let's quickly go on up. We've now been flying in some pretty uh, pretty heinous weather here, uh, for us at least, our little visual pilots. Let's go ahead and get our weather uh, changed a little bit. Let's go ahead and, and assume out of the coast here that this cumulus layer had not made it out here yet. We'll just delete the cloud layer. We're going to keep the rain in. That's kind of fun. But we're going to go ahead and delete that cloud layer. 
and let's watch the simulator redraw that. There we are. So now we can see the ground below. We're in good shape there. And we can kind of go ahead and start our descent. So let's go ahead and move over to our descent checklist. That is well down our checklist here. Where is it? Did I miss it? Descent. Okay, seat and seat belt secure. Fuel selector. Let's make sure that's on both. Good to go. Mixture, we're going to start slowly enriching that. I want to shock cool the engine by throwing that all in at once. Uh, engine instruments, we still have uh, temperature and pressure. We're looking good. Avionics are set. In this case, we've got our uh, navigation instruments as our avionics. Nav GPS switch, we don't need to worry about as we are, or it's selected appropriately rather, on the nav. Uh, aircraft lights is required. Let's go ahead and get our landing light on. And the pitot heat we have on as well. Okay, so that's uh, descent checklist complete, uh, assuming we keep our mixture moving in. Let's go ahead and get a descent going. We can actually see the aircraft, the airport off there in the distance. So if we want to descend with our autopilot, we can just hit zoom in so you can see. We can actually just hit this down. And that's going to show us our feet per minute. And now we can go, let's go ahead and get a little more aggressive than 500 because we know that was going to put us close. So let's go about a 700 foot per minute descent um, in there. Now it's going to start descending us and we're going to start picking up airspeed if we don't reduce our power. So if we're going to get a nice cruise descent going, we're going to want to take our power down a notch and make sure that our airspeed does not get up here in the yellow arc that is our smooth air only operating and we are riding in the rain and I would not call this exactly smooth air. Our DME is showing 13.2 so we've got about 13 miles to go. Got a nice descent coming in. We can actually see the airport up ahead so that's great to have some visual confirmation of things. As we approach Hilton Head Airport here, we have our beacon guiding us in here in the heavy rain. Ready to get on the ground and call an Uber. Get on over to the hotel for the night, get some rest for a flight over to Jacksonville tomorrow. We'll start heading down the coast, beginning that way. This is a great time for the subscribe checklist. Like this video, let me know you're watching. Subscribe to the channel. Make sure you keep up with all the future videos. And leave a comment if you feel so inclined. We're entering a right downwind for runway 21 here at KHXD. Traffic pattern altitude is 1,019 feet. So we'll hold that here and we'll get a gums check. Established here in the pattern, head out towards the water and get configured to land. Flying in the pattern, it's important to have your view set up well. It's really tough to look around and see exactly where you are and determine when you need to turn if you don't have your view set up nicely. So, I'll show you a couple of those momentarily. Let's get a gums check. Gas is on both. Undercarriage down and locked. Mixture is full rich. It is. Props full forward. Seatbelts, switches, and light is on. Just how we like it. We'll go ahead and pull our power out. If you do a glance right, I like a glance right, it just gets you right to the right. We'll go ahead and pull our power out to 1600. Doing our first notch of flaps. that airspeed bleed off just a bit to about 85 and then we'll start coming down with it we'll work on adjusting our trim so you're looking at trying to get about a 500 foot per minute descent rate going on but ultimately you're pitching for your airspeed 
this point. So you want to maintain your power around 1600 and your airspeed around 85 for this descent. We can go ahead and make our turn towards base leg. So right now it's really tough to look out the window and tell where where we are in relation to the runway without getting really really kind of disoriented or if we don't have a head tracking device and you can't really see that well out the corner. So it's oftentimes very hard to judge your final approach and when that needs to happen. But once you level out here, we can throw in another notch of flaps, glance off to the right and see and judge where we are. 75 is about what we're looking for for this base leg on our airspeed. We'll make sure that we keep our descent coming on down. Let's glance over again and see. We're probably about ready for that turn. We'll go ahead and bring that turn in. It's better to undershoot it a little bit than overshoot it. If you've got the option, overshooting can cause some overcontrolling and don't want to get into a stall spin situation low to the ground. So if our airspeed's getting a little low, we pitch over a little bit and pick it back up. And if our altitude's getting a little low, we can power up a bit. I think this is working out nicely. We can probably add a little bit of power here and keep our flaps where they are for now. little bit low. We got three reds, but we'll keep our power in a little bit and watch that come in. There's our two whites, two reds. That's where we want to be, right on glide path. Got a little wind coming in from our right here. So we're going to want to dip our wings slightly into the wind, our right wings slightly into the wind, and keep a little bit of left rudder pressure in. Go ahead and put our last notch of flaps in and looking for about Bit, looking for about 65 knots airspeed. Not final here. At this point, we'll just make very fine adjustments with our power and our pitch to make sure that we keep everything very nicely stabilized. Make sure your trim looks good. If you're having to really jerk your throttle or your, I'm sorry, your joystick around, uh, it can really make for an unstable approach if you have to release that pressure a little bit. So. We're using our left rudder to keep our cells aligned with the runway, and we're, we're using our right aileron to correct for our drift that the wind is, is trying to push us off to the left. Not a whole bunch of control input there. And we'll go ahead and pull our power out. Shut it down for the night here. Over by the Uber we've called. Nice limo I've arranged for us to get into town. Hope you've enjoyed the flight. Tune in next time as we fly down to Jacksonville on our way down to the Bahamas. Until then, enjoy your flying.